You've just joined the Prepper Broadcasting Network, where we promote self-reliance and independence. The views and opinions expressed are strictly those of the host or their guests. Visit us in the interactive chat room at PrepperBroadcasting.com. Recently, we went to a wolf sanctuary. It was really cool. I don't think I've ever seen wolves in person. And I, uh, we got to go, we got to tour the facility, but before they let you actually go and see the wolves, they made you sit through a little presentation about the wolves, which was a good presentation. They weren't forcing you. It was very interesting. And during that time, the instructor who was giving us our lesson was asking us that uh, about if we were afraid of wolves, right? It was mostly kids. This was a homeschool trip. So she was asking the homeschool kids, are you afraid of wolves? And a lot of them, obviously, little kids said, yes, we're afraid of the wolves. And she says, why? And she's, they talked about the scary stories, um, the big bad wolf huffing and puffing and blowing the house down. They talked about Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, and then the instructor says to us, you know, people have been afraid of wolves for such a long time, needlessly. We don't need to be afraid of the wolf. Uh, but all these old stories make us afraid of the wolf. Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf. And that's why we're afraid of wolves. But we don't have to be. And I get it. They're trying to, you know, they're being ambassadors of the wolf. They want us to like these animals. But I couldn't help but think about what we had read in the Little House series. You guys, if you've been following the show for a while, you know that I'm a very big fan of the Little House books. And I remember the way they described the wolf. In, uh, in the Little House series, Laura begins... It's uh, on page three. She's lying awake at night. And she tells us At night, when Laura lay awake in the trundle bed, she listened and could not hear anything at all but the sounds of the trees whispering together. Sometimes far away in the night, a wolf howled. Then he came nearer and howled again. It was a scary sound. Laura knew that wolves would eat little girls, but she was safe inside the solid log walls. Her father's gun hung over the door, and good old Jack, the bulldog, lay on guard before it. Her father would say, go to sleep, Laura. Jack won't let the wolves in. So Laura snuggled under her covers of her trundle bed, close beside Mary, and went to sleep. One night her father picked her up out of bed and carried her to the window so she might see the wolves. There were two of them sitting in front of the house. They looked like shaggy dogs. They pointed their noses at the bright moon and howled. Jack paced up and down before the door, growling. The hair stood up along his back and he showed his sharp, fierce teeth to the wolves. They howled but they could not get in. People were afraid of wolves back then because, well, they were surrounded by them and they were these fierce, frightening dogs. You read of wolves a lot throughout this series and all in all, as you weave through these tales of these wolves and the fear that they would inspire, you also read about Jack, the homestead dog. He was a little bulldog And in fact, he's on the cover. If you read Little House on the Prairie, you can see that Jack is walking underneath the wagon as they head out west. Little Jack walked underneath that wagon the entire journey. He crossed the United States. It's a pretty impressive feat for a small little bulldog. And he plays a major role in their family. Jack was the family dog. The kids could sit and play with him. They loved him. 
and you can hear that as in the way Laura describes their interaction with Jack, the family dog. Uh, he was a protector. He would protect them from strangers. He would protect them from wolves. He would sit in the doorway and keep wolves from coming in towards the house. He was a, a hunter. You read stories of Jack, a Pa getting ready to head out into the prairie and go hunting. He had no meat for dinner, so he uh, stood against the wall and took down his gun. And it says Jack wanted to go hunting too. His eyes begged Pa to take him. And wines came up from his chest and quivered in his throat till Laura almost cried with him. But Pa chained him to the stable. When they were out in the prairie, they wouldn't let Jack go along because uh, they, he needed to stay home and guard for them. As they're traveling across the prairie, something very sad happens. Uh, they get to a big river and they have to ford the river and it doesn't look too deep. And so they get ready to start crossing. Jack's on the shore and Pa says, Jack can swim it. And they start across the river and it gets deeper than they expected. The horses struggle. Pa actually has to jump off of the wagon and swim and help pull the horses. And when they get to the other side of the shore, they're looking around and they don't see Jack anywhere. They look and look and look, but they can't find him. And now they're getting sad because they realize something bad has happened. Laura asks her dad she's and her ma, she says, Oh, ma, Jack has gone to heaven, hasn't he? She's afraid he's died. He was such a good dog. Can't he go to heaven? You know, as a parent, when your kid asks you a question like this, and you're thinking about how you're going to answer. Ma said she did not know what to answer. It says Ma did not know what to answer. But Pa said, yes, Laura, he can. God that doesn't forget the sparrows won't leave a good dog like Jack out in the cold. Laura felt only a little better. She was not happy. Pa did not whistle about his work as usual. And after a while, he said, and what we'll do in wild country Without a good watchdog, I don't know. When we think about homesteading, a dog is a vital role, plays a vital role in that lifestyle, whether you're crossing the prairie 200 years ago or if you're a homesteader now. And what good your homestead will be without a dog? Well, I don't know the answer to that either. And so in tonight's episode of Home Study, we're going to talk about the homestead dog. And we're going to talk about a dual purpose dog. A dog that can give us, it can be a hunter for us. A dog that can help protect the livestock. A dog that can do lots for us. So we're going to get into that topic today. We're going to be taking questions. So stick with us. Thanks for joining us tonight, guys, for our discussion on a homestead dog. And uh, just bear with me for one minute. I got my six-year-old running our video mixer tonight. So if you want to say hi to him in the chat box, I'll convey your messages. Uh, we're at the moment. We have a little bit of a technical difficulty that will take me just a second to fix. Our, uh, our mixer board, our audio mixer, just disappeared from the screen. <laughs> So we're going to bring that up, and we're going to take a minute to say hello to all you who joined us tonight in the live show. So thank you for joining us. Just give me one minute here to open up our, our uh, software. There we go. Let's pop. I had to reboot. Classic reboot, right? When something's not working on a computer, it's just reboot. 
There it is, open. All right, and we're good. So first we're gonna say hello to everybody over in YouTube. We got uh, John Lords here. Let me pull uh, pull this open so I can read all your comments. We got uh, Tag Well Farms, The Weekend Homestead, uh, Travis Skipworth, Bluey Black. Lots of chatting going on, Little Mountain Ranch. So thanks for joining us, guys. If you have any questions, be sure to tag at Homesteady. And over at Prepper Broadcasting, we got Flying Dutchman. We got Maui. We got uh, Michelle or Michael Klein. That's the name I always get wrong, guys. Sorry, it's one of those. Jay Fergie's here. Uh, so thanks for joining us for tonight's discussion, guys. We're going to be, as usual, taking questions and calls towards the end of the episode. So if you have a question uh, something you want to say, something you want to add, we would love to hear it. All you have to do is make sure to tag at Homesteady so that your question stands out big and bold to me. And at the very you know last 15 minutes of the show, we'll go through all questions. Uh, if you got a story to share of a favorite Homestead dog, maybe some tips or advice, uh, we'll, we'll put the call-in number in the chat box so you can join us in whatever way you feel like joining us with. So we got our mixer back up and running here. I got my six-year-old. I figured I better start training him now. That way by the time he's 10, he can run this whole show and I can move you know, to the islands and let him run the homestead and the business. <laughs> so tonight we want to talk about the homestead dog. By the way, if you want to know what happened to Jack, they do fill you in. And I suggest you read the Little House on the Prairie books. Uh, they're fantastic. They're great books for a homesteader. Really fun to read with kids. But you don't necessarily need to read them with kids. You could read them by yourself because they're just that good. Can you hear, buddy? Everything working good? All right. So I am joined by a special guest tonight. He looks like he's asleep. We got my pup on the floor over here, Bones. And uh, he's, uh, let's get the Bones camera up and running here. <laughs> Come on, pup. There he is. So we got Bones with us tonight, and uh, he'll be here to help us tell, the, tell our stories. It's okay, bud. So. Let's talk about dogs. I grew up with dogs. I grew up, uh, the one animal that my hat, my parents had when we were young, all the years, we, we had a couple different animals growing up, but the one we always had was dogs. And the farthest back I can remember, we had a shepherd that was named Banjo. And uh, Banjo was a full-blooded German Shepherd really just nice nature dog really friendly and uh, I would play with Banjo and we had a couple others at the time run around the property and I remember still again I was probably four or five I remember when we had to put Banjo down he grew to a good old age you know Shepherds don't grow too old but uh, I still remember when we when we had to put him down, his back legs were given like they usually do with the German Shepherds. And uh, my parents had to delay it because even at that age of four or five, I was just way too sad. And uh, they, they, didn't, they couldn't handle me. <laughs> so my love for dogs goes back as far as I can remember. And it's said that you will live longer if you own dogs. So seeing as I've owned them since the age I was four, and I got one sitting right down here uh, beside me, I guess hopefully I'll live a ripe old age because uh, I've been surrounded by them my whole life. Since we've been on the homestead here, we've had three really nice dogs. We've had a uh, we had a Rottweiler, and we've had two Labs, and uh, on top of that, we've also had a couple others that were here for a short time, kind of fostered and helped out other people with their pups for a little while. Uh, so we'll get to that in a little bit. But let's talk about, in tonight's discussion, what we want to really focus on is a farm slash hunting dog. And this isn't something you hear a lot about. A lot of people cover, you know, your farm dog. Um, other people cover 
the hunting dog. Uh, I find as a homesteader, like the Ingalls were, and I'm not saying we're like the Ingalls, but the Ingalls were homesteaders who crossed the country. They did a lot of farming, but they did a lot of hunting. Uh, they needed a dog for family protection. I find as a modern day homesteader, what you need and what you want out of a dog is not much different. I really want to have a good protector. I want a dog that'll protect me and my family. I want a dog that'll protect my livestock. I also want a great companion. I don't want a vicious animal. I want to feel comfortable when my little you know, baby crawls up to the pup and starts playing with his face. Uh, I want a dog that I feel comfortable with in that way. You guys know I'm a big hunter. I love hunting. And so I want a dog that will be able to go with me into the field, you know, flush some birds, um, help me not only flush the birds, find the birds, flush the birds, retrieve the birds. The whole, you know, the whole deal there. I also want a dog that can track. Uh, maybe if I'm out bow hunting for deer, in our state you're not allowed to uh, use dogs for either hunting deer or tracking deer, but in some states they'll let you use dogs to recover deer. New York is one of those and we're not too far. So having a dog that I could use to, you know, do a little bit of everything. That's the dog we're going to talk about tonight. The perfect homestead hunting, you know, homesteading farm dog. A dog that will retrieve a bird that you need it to retrieve, uh, but that's not going to chase and kill your chickens. You know, a bird that when you say fetch, it'll go and grab that pheasant. But when your ducks are running around the front yard, it won't touch them. It'll even if you're not there. This kind of dog is possible to have. And if you don't believe me, we made a video earlier today to prove it. <laughs> so we're going to play as uh, as we go through tonight's episode. I'm not going to play the audio from this video. I'm just in the sidebar. You're just going to see beside me. Uh, some of the work we were doing with Bones earlier today. Uh, you'll see the video pop up uh, from time to time. You'll see just Bones running around. You'll see him running around the farm. You'll see him uh, running around. Let's see here. Where's that? Do we get it up? Where's our? Oh, it's right there. So you'll see as we go through today, you'll get to uh, you get to just observe our farm slash hunting dog. Uh, but the biggest thing that I want you to see as we're looking through this is just how he is with the livestock, how he is with you know, all the other animals. Uh, because that's important, not just a hunting dog, not just a farm dog, but a good, a good both dog. <laughs> and uh, again, we're having a little technical difficulties here, guys. So let me just fix our video so you can see. And if you're listening, over at Prepper Broadcasting, you guys can pull up the video later when you get home and uh, take a look at it. It's just about a 20 minute video and you don't even have to watch the whole thing. You just can can see the basic stuff that we're talking about here. So let me, uh, let me just pull this up for you guys. I just have to adjust something here. So I thought we were going to be free of uh, bloopers tonight. Everything was running perfectly before we started, but you know that can never uh, you can never get through a whole night without something, right? Okay, here we go. All right, that's back up. So. There we are. All right, we're up and running here. Before we get into how to get yourself this homestead dog, let's talk about the history that we've had with our dogs. Let's go through all of them and let you know what we've done. Because to be honest, you know, you'll watch this video and uh, you'll see, you know, throughout this video that I'm showing on the sidebar. If you go and watch it later, uh, we have a very well, I'm, I'm, happily feel comfortable bragging about this dog we are very proud of bones and what he's done but we have not always had perfect dogs we've not always been you know we didn't always know what we were doing with training we didn't always know 
even what the right dog for us would be. So let's go through the stories. We started off, my, my wife and I, when we started buying dogs, with a newspaper dog. And what I mean by that is, you know, we were down, we're actually, we were on vacation and we were, uh, I think we were in Rhode Island. We saw a poster on the market that we were at. This poster, puppies for sale. And I was a newly, newer wed, wasn't quite newly wed, but newer wed. And I'd never gone to looking, look at puppies with my wife before. A mistake I no longer make. So we went to look, just look at puppies. And they were just backyard, excuse me, backyard breeders. They had no, no papers. They didn't have any history. They just had a bunch of little Rottweiler puppies. And they were asking, I think they were asking $1,000 or $800. It was a very big figure for no papers, just backyard breeder. Uh, we did not pay that for the dog. <laughs> but we did wind up going home with one of those puppies. And she was a very, very nice dog. Her name was Livy. We named her Livy. Great dog, very friendly. But she taught us a very important lesson, which was to avoid the newspaper dogs. She was a result of some bad breeding. And the two biggest identifiers, the two biggest ways you could tell, first was her intelligence. She lacked good intelligence. She was just, her nickname was Dummy. And the second part, which was the much more serious part, uh, she, we actually lost her at two years of age. We didn't know exactly why. We brought her to the vet. They were doing some tests. But their, their best guess was that it was possible. She was very small. She was like a kind of a runt. And uh, they thought she, because of poor breeding, she may have been stunted and uh, her kidneys just couldn't keep up so she had kidney failure and it was very very sad we lost her at two years old and so we learned our lesson you know especially when you're buying a purebred dog no more backyard breeders no more newspapers now since that time we uh of buying livy i had gotten into hunting more and i started experimenting a little bit with bird hunting and so as we were preparing to get our next dog, I thought to myself, you know what? It only makes sense if I'm going to spend money on a good quality animal that I get something that will be able to help me in the field that I can hunt with, that I can, you know, use to track game where it's legal. And so the search for a bird dog began. We had learned from our mistakes. We wanted a repu reputable breeder. We wanted... Um, a dog that was really good quality that we would know that we could prove and so not the search for a dog the search for a breeder began and we spent months calling different breeders having different discussions you know long long discussions we didn't want to have the backyard breeder we also didn't want to support puppy mills you know we didn't want to have some you know dog that we didn't know where it was coming from and how it was treated uh, so eventually we found three seeders retrievers and they're what you might call a boutique breeder and what i mean by that is they're not a backyard breeder that doesn't know what they're doing and maybe you know just finds the next dog in the next town over and breeds them uh, but they're also not a giant puppy mill who doesn't care about what they're doing is just spitting dogs out uh, they're small enough to take great care of their dogs but they have a good reputation to uphold, and so they take great care and selection of the, their dogs. They have a paper trail, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later, uh, you know, what to look for in a breeder. But anyway, the boutique breeder, Three Seeders Retrievers, is who we went with, and we uh, never looked back. And since then, we've owned two labs from Three Seeders Retrievers. Now, you're probably wondering, I only have one sitting down here, uh, looking very tired and sullen from his long day. Why do I only have one if I've purchased two from them in the last couple of years? Well, sadly, we lost our second dog, our lab. His name was Boone. We lost him tragically. And if you want to hear that story, we have a past podcast episode that came out a couple of years ago. It's called Emergency on the Farm. And uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes so you can check that out. Uh, that was very sad. And it has a very, there's a very good warning 
message or lesson to that story. So I do suggest any of you dog owners out there, check out that previous episode, but maybe don't listen to it like while you're at work around other people because it's a bit of a tearjerker. We really loved Boone and we were really proud of where he was and replacing him was very tough, but we did get his little brother, which made it a lot better. His little brother Bones here, who's named after him. And uh, now I'm a yellow lab. This is my second yellow lab. And if you, again, if you pay attention to the video that we have, and we'll pop that video back up, you can just see some of the work that Bones is capable capable of, some of the work that he's done. Uh, he's really made us proud. <laughs> Not that video. That's the video of him sleeping. <laughs> Since then, we've also had a few dogs here for a short period of time on the farm. We had a great Pyrenees for a short time. Uh, my, I had some in-laws, not my parents, but my brother-in-law who had a standard poodle who needed a home for a little while, so we fostered that dog. And uh, both dogs, I while they were here, I spent some time doing some training with. And uh, since beginning, well, way back with our Rottweiler, Rottweiler Livy, that's a tough one for me to say, I have learned a ton about training your homestead hunting farm dog i've had dogs that killed chickens i've had dogs like this one right here who has never ever killed a chicken in his life and let's hope that continues <laughs> so tonight we're gonna dive into that how you can have a great homestead breed and we're gonna do that right after we come back from a, an ad but before we go to our ad break uh, I just want to tell you one thing. We have a very important survey over at thisishomestudy.com, and I want to make sure everyone hears it, so we're not going to break to the ad yet. We'll break to ad right after this. We're doing a survey over at thisishomestudy.com to find out what you guys want us to do with the show. So we've been producing a podcast, we're doing this live stream on YouTube and over at Prepper Broadcasting, we do videos on YouTube, and we're trying to decide moving forward what to focus our efforts on and how often to produce all these different things. So guys, this is really important. If you like this weekly live stream that we're doing right now on Prepper Broadcasting, if you like listening to our weekly radio show over there, after we're done... Right now, later, tomorrow, whenever you want to do it, head over to thisishomestudy.com. There's on the homepage a big button, take this survey. You can win a $100 gift card to Tractor Supply for taking the survey, so there's that. Let us know. It's about a three or four minute survey. It's not a big deal. It looks kind of long, but I timed it. It only takes a couple minutes to do. And uh, in that survey, we just find out from you what's your favorite thing we produce, how, how often do you want us to produce it, and what's more important, quality versus quantity, that sort of thing. Give us your advice what to do going forward with the show because we will be cutting some things. And if you want to make sure that this is not one of them, make sure to let us know in that survey. So we're going to be considering that for the next month. And before we cut to break, very big thanks to Ben Newman for the $5 Super Chat. Ben, we will be sure to get to that question. How do you break older dogs of the chicken attack instinct? Uh, we'll talk about that later in the show. So thanks to Ben for helping to support the show. And now let's take a quick break, and we'll be back after a quick word from our sponsors. Hey, Joe Alton, MD of store.doombloom.net here. And I'm nurse practitioner Amy Alton, and we're here to get you medical. Guys, over on YouTube, as usual, your um, commercial <laughs> is just me mentioning that we are able to do these live streams with the help of that super chat. And Ben is always a huge supporter. Ben, thank you. If you want to leave us a super chat, it's very easy. In the chat box, you'll see that little button with the dollar sign on it. You just click that. You can give us a dollar. You might think, a dollar, what's that going to do? The average YouTube video that we produce makes way less than a dollar. It makes like five, ten cents. So when you give even just one dollar to these live super chats, that video spikes in its income. It's really a big deal, and we appreciate every penny. It's how we're able to do this. So we're so thankful for all you guys who've supported the show in all your ways. And if you can't super chat, don't worry. You can still help support the show. Right now, during the commercial break, send the link, the share link, your URL at the top, Send it to a friend, email them, 
you know, social media, say, hey, check this out. This guy's talking about homestead dogs. Uh, helping to grow the show is another big way you can support it. We're very grateful for all your support in every way. And uh, it's the way we're able to do all this stuff. So thank you, Ben. And thank you to everybody else who's listening. Who knows? One thing's certain, my family and I will always have food on the table. To learn more, go to HarvestRight.com or call 800-923-9591. That's HarvestRight.com or 800-923-9591. When disaster strikes and your GPS is useless, ancient navigation techniques will ensure your survival. New from Ulysses Press, Prepper's Survival Navigation. With this guide, you can easily travel through even the farthest, remotest places, utilizing tips from the United States Army and lifelong wilderness experts. You'll learn life-saving navigation techniques. This definitive guide to terrain navigation also teaches you essential survival skills like firecraft, water procurement, and shelter making. Prepper's survival navigation is essential to have on hand during any outdoor adventure, including the weekend family outing. On sale now. Find Prepper's Survival Navigation on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Prepper Broadcasting, or wherever fine books are sold. All right, guys, we're back. Thanks for sticking with us. If you're watching over on YouTube, you'll notice that in this video uh, that we're playing on the side, you'll start to see us walking around the farm. And just observe my bird dog, who is a bird dog, around our chickens and our... uh, our ducks and our turkeys, you'll see that he's just very calm, never goes after any of them. And we're going to talk about that because that's very important. We're seeing questions already in the chat box over on YouTube. How do you get him to stop with, you know, killing chickens? That's a major factor. So before we get there, though, let's talk about breeds because I do feel that you're shooting yourself in the foot if you start off with the wrong breed of dog. So what is the best homestead breed? You'll see a lot of people, you know, for LGD, Livestock Guardian Dogs, you know, they use the Pyrenees. There's other LGD breeds. I know uh, Jack Spierko, he's a big, you know, big name in this realm. Jack's got Shepherds, which Shepherds great dogs. You know, for sheep and and, uh, people who use sheep and goat dogs, you know, kind of herding dogs. There's options there. There's cattle dogs and people love their dogs they get into their breed and that's their dog of choice Uh, there's a really funny youtube video and i'm gonna just post the link to it you can watch it later a guy offers people i'll post a link in the chat box here uh he offers people a hundred thousand dollars for their dog and he can't get anybody to trade their dog for a hundred thousand dollars so if people won't trade their own their own dog for a hundred thousand dollars they're definitely not going to agree with me on what the best breed is. So I'm not going to convince anybody who's sold on their breed, and I'm not trying to. Tonight, I just want to tell you my opinion, my IMHO. <laughs> so IMHO, in my honest opinion, you cannot beat a lab for your homestead dog. And there's a couple different reasons for this. The lab, for one, wants to please my my guy here laying down sitting on his bed right here he wants to please whatever i say whatever i want him to do he wants to do it and if he doesn't know what i want him to do he's quick to figure it out uh another thing that you can get from your lab uh he's not gonna want to if you if you train him right he's not gonna want to kill the animals but he will have the hunting and tracking ability So that's a big one because you can get a dog with a hunt drive or a tracking drive, but if he doesn't have the equipment and the good nose, the good breeding, he's not going to be good at it. Uh, So a lab, a lab is a dog that not only a lot of times will have that drive and that desire to hunt, but he'll have the good nose for it and the good ability for it. Uh, so to find an animal that's willing to please, that's got hunting drive, that's got the the goods for it, um, you know, that multi-use for the homestead, 
I think of it, you know, the jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. A lab is never going to be a herding dog. If you're just herding sheep, you're not going to want to choose your lab. But if you have a homestead like me and, and sometimes you need an extra hand to help you get the chickens corralled in, my lab is perfectly capable of being that animal. And you'll see in, in the video we're playing in the side here and, and just some of the commands I've taught him, I'm able to use him to kind of corral animals. So at the same time, he can hunt, he can you know keep away the predators. So the lab is a great jack of all trades. They're incredibly intelligent if you find, a, again, a good one. There are bad ones out there, and we'll talk about that when you're looking for it. Uh, but you know, you, you're better off with the lab. You're going to have a smart dog that wants to please you. We had that standard poodle, and that thing was an incredibly smart dog, and it didn't care at all what I thought. It didn't want to please. It didn't want to listen. It was smart. It could get itself out of trouble. It could figure stuff out real quick, but it was not. It had no willingness willingness to please. And so again, that's why uh, when we're talking about the different uh, options for a homestead dog, we might consider we might consider the lab as the best option. It's definitely my favorite. So let's talk about how to buy that hunting slash farm dog. I know in our day and age, people make you out to be a criminal if you buy a dog. Every dog in the world has to be a rescue or you're some kind of awful human. So here's me on YouTube going out to say why I don't buy rescues. And I'm sure we're going to get eventually some hate comments for this. But that's okay. It's just YouTube comments. So I've learned a long time ago not to take those personally. The reason I don't do a rescue dog here on our farm is because we know exactly the kind of dog we want. And we need that exact dog at a very early stage. So unless I could find a high-quality lab that was an eight week old puppy, that dog is not gonna work on our homestead. And the biggest reason why is because we need to expose that puppy at a very young age to all of our livestock, to all of our situations, because we don't just own a dog. You can rescue a dog if all you are gonna have is a dog. It's not gonna have chickens to kill, it's not gonna have goats to chase. By all means, go for it. But if you have a homestead and a ton of animals, a rescue dog, by the time you get that dog, it's going to be a liability on your homestead. You're going to lose animals to it. You might not be able to use it for what you want. And so for us, rescues are not an option. No. Now that said, I'm not saying go out and support puppy mills or backyard breeders who do a crappy job. Again, go for the boutique breeder. So how do you know if someone is a boutique breeder? Well, First off, you look at the size. When you call the company up, do you talk to the owner or do you talk to a high school kid who's working at a place like a, you know, in the mall, you can go and buy a puppy. You want to talk to the owner and you want the owner to be an incredibly knowledgeable person who is screening you, not the other way around. When I called Three Cedars Retrievers and said, hi, I'm interested in getting a dog from you. He said, okay, you have to fill out this paperwork first. He wanted character references on me because he was not going to send one of his high quality, amazing animals to a family who A, couldn't handle it, B, wouldn't take good care of it. A good quality boutique breeder is going to have you leave a deposit on a dog. They're going to have a waiting list because people are going to want their dogs. Right now, uh, Jack from Three Cedars has already deposits on a dog that is not even had a litter yet. It's just a dog that exists that will eventually be bred. So that shows you the quality. These dogs are in high demand. They're going to health screen their animals. They're going to make sure the animals don't have, you know, certain genetic problems. The breeder is going to take time with you. He's going to make sure you are understanding what you're getting into. The first phone call I had with Jack from Three Seeders, I spent an hour and a half. I, the guy had no, none of my money. And he spent an hour and a half talking to me about life with a lab. He had a mission statement for his dogs. He was breeding the companion gun dog. So a great dog for the field, but a dog that would also be great companion for the family. 
<clears throat> and that's exactly what we got. And of course, uh, he wanted a, when we went to Jack, we knew what we wanted. We wanted a calmer, good family companion dog that had the nose of a hunter, that had the skills of the hunter, but who would be okay just laying there on the bed next to me, uh, playing with the baby, you know, whatever, whatever we wanted. And that's exactly what we got. We, the first time around with Boone and then the second time around with Bones. Bones, when people see this dog, they are impressed. And honestly, it is not because of, it is not, I'm not a special dog trainer, don't have special skills. I just go by the book with dog training, you know, 101. This dog is a dog who is from a good genetics. He's from intelligence. He's good quality. And he was handpicked for our family. So a good breeder can say, okay, these are the puppies, but they're not all for you. Uh, so when you go to get your puppy, a good breeder won't let you pick whatever you want. I mean, he will at the end of the day if you're paid and you know it's your turn to pick. But he'll suggest that if you don't know what you're looking for, which we didn't at the time, we didn't know how to pick out the right puppy, he could pick it for you. And that's what Jack did. He said, this is the right pup for you. And actually, when we went and got him, it was interesting because this pup kind of picked us. All the puppies came running out. And Jack has different color collars on them all. And he knew the one with the orange collar or the one with the red collar were the two options he was going to tell us to go for. And little orange collar over here came running out and started playing with the kids. And there we have it. So how do you train your hunting slash farm dog well again we talked about this it's really important to start right away with the right exposure your dog needs to right away be experiencing things that he's supposed to experience that he'll be around all his life and again this is why we don't do um rescues because we just can't guarantee they've had the right exposure that we need them to do so day one your puppy gets home to the farm and you want to put a little leash on him and walk him around the farm and you want him to see the chickens and you want him to see the ducks and you want them to flutter in his face and every time he goes to play with those you give him a little jerk on that leash and you know just a nice firm no and trust me walking him around the farm chickens ducks goats every day the minute he goes to lunch for him no on the leash he'll get it a smart dog that's willing to please is going to figure that out this little puppy has no unmonitored time with the livestock he doesn't get to be out with all the animals without you being right there too many people think they can buy a livestock guardian dog put it out in the field and it'll naturally know what to do it doesn't work that way this little puppy needs to get basic obedience this puppy needs to be learning and not as a puppy. So your basic obedience, you know, your fundamentals, you begin, you know, no, and that sort of thing. But as they get a couple of weeks, most of it's just play in the beginning. Then as it gets a little older, you start with your basic obedience, your sit. No, that's real early on. Come. You'll notice if you watch that video of me working with bones in the field, um, he, when I tell him to sit, he sits. I don't tell him stay. I don't say sit and then stay. I just tell him sit because sit means sit. And that's important. That dog should start with a sit. And when you say sit, that's what that means. And then he learns the term okay, which tells him, okay, you're done. Now you can leave. And I do that. I'll have a leash on him, a collar on him rather, and a clip. And I clip him to a post and I tell him sit. And when he goes to move, that kind of pulls tight on him. And so so oh, that's good sit means sit leave the video playing okay come when you're teaching come you want to have a check cord on your dog so every time you give a command that dog has no other option but to be obedient so Always that when you're working on cum or casting and that sort of thing, you have a check cord which allows you to have the control that you need. Another great thing to work on with a puppy is a pressure on off drill. And so what that is, is you pick that, you scoop that puppy up and you hold him tight 
and he'll start to struggle and kind of, you know, go back and forth and try to get out. And you hold him tight until he settles down. And as soon as he settles down, you loosen your grip. Pressure on off. That's a, a tip I learned from Dokken. Dokken is a very popular um, dog trainer for the Labradors. You can do that with his paw. Just grab his paw. He won't like it. He'll try to get the paw out of your hand. You hold on to that paw. You don't let him win. And as soon as he relaxes, pressure off. Eventually, he'll learn when you put pressure on, he better just relax. And then the pressure stops. These are pressure on off drills. And these are all the early days. And you just focus on your basic obedience because you can't have a good homestead dog or hunting dog without a good sit, without a good responsive dog to your pressure. He has to know what come means. He has to know what no means. At eating time, you put that bowl out and you tell him okay when it's time for him to eat. He doesn't get to jump in and just start munching. He sits and you put that bowl down and he waits. And when you say okay, he can have his food. And again, being able to reinforce these commands is important. So have a leash on him. If he dives for that food, quick jerk on the leash and just a no. And do that as many times as it needs. And the beautiful thing with basic obedience is your everyday life, you can teach basic obedience constantly. You teach that sit every time you feed him. You have to feed him you know, two times a day. Teach sit. Teach okay two times a day. And that's great regular reinforcement of the basics. A well-behaved farm dog is not going to kill your animals. Now, if he's been exposed at a young age and you've done that no, no, no technique, uh, he will not be interested in. We have a great picture of Bones. It's a thumbnail of our previous video. He's sitting in his pen and four little ducklings walk into his pen to drink out of his water bowl. And this is a bird dog who retrieves birds for me day in, day out, and he's just sitting there watching them. So he will not, he's never attacked a, a guinea or a chicken or any of our animals, and he will not because he knows from a young age he's been exposed to this. It's not exciting, it's not new, and he knows they are off limits. And he knows that he's retrieving when we retrieve for me. So teaching basic retrieving and field work, it starts off as fun. You're just throwing a ball, kicking a ball, whatever it is. But as you get, when they start to lose their puppy teeth, you start to work formally with them on their retrieving. And they learn that field work, retrieving, tracking, that's all done for you. It's not done for him. And so that starts with the basic, basic commands. I have a couple tools that we use regularly. So here's a bumper. Uh, that's what we use to teach retrieving. He can catch a ball and run with the ball and do whatever he wants. But when we're working with bumpers, he has to obey me. He has to be retrieving for me. I have a whistle to teach whistle commands. I have an electric collar, an e-collar. And an e-collar has, uh, the one I have, it has 10 different degrees of stimulus, 10 different degrees of shock. A lot of people don't like the idea of a shock collar, but remember we're on a farm, we're using electric netting to shock the chickens to teach them where not to go. We use it with the goats. The dog collar has a very low setting and you do not use this to teach obedience, you use this to enforce well-learned obedience. So a, a dog that doesn't understand basic obedience, you could put him up to a 10, you're gonna hurt the poor thing and he's not gonna have a clue what you want him to do. You teach all basic obedience before you ever think of using an e-collar. And then when you have a well-obedient, well-trained dog, use that when you're out somewhere dangerous and he has to listen to you. If you're out hunting and you're near a road and you say sit and he takes off running near a road, he could die. So a gentle shock to reinforce him long distance is going to be a very effective tool as opposed to letting him run into the road because he's following you know, the bird that you told him to retrieve. And then I have an English lead, which is a great tool for teaching heel, which is a great command for controlling, controlling your pup. So these are all basic tools and basic commands, and you just focus on that basic obedience in the beginning. If you've never trained a dog from start to finish for hunting and field work, and you plan on taking a dog hunting or to the field, I suggest finding a mentor, someone who's done it before, or a trainer who you have to hire. And we did this with Bones. Um, I had never successfully gotten a dog actually into the field. And so just when I thought he was ready 
and I was ready to head out into the woods with him, I found a, a professional dog trainer and I didn't have him train the dog. I wanted to do the training, but I needed him to oversee and tell me, okay, have I, have I covered everything? Am I ready for this actual experience? And he found some holes in my training and he was able to point those out. And he taught me who then was able to teach the dog. Uh, so you can do all the training yourself. It's better. It forms a really good bond with you and your pup. And, uh, Doing it that way, you can save a lot of money, too, because it does cost money to pay a professional to train your dog. Much better to just get a few lessons on how you can do it yourself. Because, honestly, the major part of dog training is not the dog. A major part of it is you. You need to be calm. You need to be assertive. You need to be a good alpha. And if you're not that... You're going to have a hard time training your dog. And I've found when I work with a trainer or when I go to a mentor like Jack, who I bought my dog from, Jack's a great mentor. I've found that most of the time, it's not an issue of whether or not the dog is learning right. The issue is whether or not you've learned correctly how to do it. So focusing on all that, making sure that you're uh, ready to handle that, uh, making sure that you're not, you know, yelling at the dog, hitting the dog, losing your temper, uh, throwing too many commands. Uh, that's the kind of thing that taking some time with a mentor or someone who knows what they're doing is going to help you with. It's a ton to talk about, and we only have an hour-long show, and I see we're already up on 53 minutes, which I'm wondering where in the world did the time go. I love talking about pups, and uh, here we are bumping up towards the end of the show. So if you have questions, uh, if you'd like to call in, uh, we'll get the number in the chat box for you to call in, and uh, just tag at Homesteady if you want to um, ask a question for me. Um, but... Make sure, if you make sure, so when you look at Bones, when you if you watch that video of me working with him today, um, I've been at this for, I've owned, I've owned my own dogs for about six years now. And I have been training them. <laughs> the first dog I did not do well with training. I hardly trained her. The second dog did a good job, um, but just didn't get very far with. So I've really only this far along been training this is my first go around and when you watch how he's doing on the videos it's he's doing great the dog is is i'm very proud of him and so it just shows that you can do a good job with it anybody can train a dog if you take the time so find yourself a good quality animal take the time with it expose it at a very young age to all the problems use the correct tools and get a little help from a mentor that's the exact method I did to get this homestead dog where we are today. And you can do that too. So I want to take, we do have a couple questions. First, Ben Newman asked, how do you break older dogs of the attack instinct on chickens? They keep trying to carry them off. Ben, this is where a e-collar does play a good part. So if you get yourself an e-collar with that adjustable setting and you teach the dog you go out for a walk with the dog, you have him on the leash, and you give him a strong no and a good you know, pull on that leash. You teach him that no means no, and that when he's going after the chickens, that that's what you're trying to tell him, no. Then you go inside your house, and you watch your dog out of a window with that e-collar on. And the minute he goes for that chicken, you get him. And at first, he's going to be... It's going to surprise him. It might spook him. And uh, then he'll forget about it and he'll go again. And boom, you'll hit him again. And you don't want to hurt the dog. You don't want him yelping. Uh, the best way to figure out the right setting to adjust your e collar to is you put it on him and it has that dial 1 to 10. And you start at 1 while he's out, not paying attention to you, running around. And you hit the 1 and you watch. And he's not even going to notice it. And then you hit number two, and he's not going to notice it. And maybe by four, suddenly you notice his ear twitch, just like a little twitch. That's your starting point. Number four, when his ear twitches, 
Then you get him, you watch him going for that chicken. You start at number four. If he doesn't respond to it, number five or number six. And trust me, you will not need to get to 10 unless you have a dog who's just very, very beyond and super into chickens. So I hope that helps. Errol Flynn. Um, Errol, Errol had a question. Let's see. Where is it? What do you think about breeding and selling dogs as a supplementary, supplementary income for the homestead? Great question. Um, I don't think you should ever breed dogs for income because even what I paid for bones, uh, you know, you pay for a dog at this is good quality dog. You'll pay money for him. Um, it's a ton of work to do right. The people who should chart, who should consider doing that as a business are people who really love doing it, are going to do it anyway so they can continue to breed their own animals. Uh, and to, to support that hobby, to support that interest, can sell the other pups. And you'll have people, you'll see who see your dog and are asking for puppies. So I've thought about this. I've thought of, I love this. I love training dogs. I love my dog. I love working and teaching them. Um, I've thought about breeding as a source of income and it's kind of the same thing. I don't think for an income, there's better ways to make money quicker, but if you love it and it's a passion of yours and you want to breed your own pup anyway, cause you want to continue that line, then sure you know, use it as a good way to support that hobby. But if you're just looking for income, I'd say look for a different way. So Mark asked how to keep your dog off chickens and ducks. Same answer, Mark. Uh, make sure that your, you know, early exposure, firm no, good tug on the leash. And if it's too far, I've never had to train with the e-collar. I've never had to use the e-collar to train bones not to go for birds. Because for him, early exposure and a good firm no, he got the point real fast. If it's gone beyond that and they've already started killing animals, then you might have to go the e-collar route. And again, use it for chickens, use it for other livestock. If you set it right and you don't, you never want to hear the dog yelping in pain, that sort of thing, it's not a cruel way to train a dog to do something he's not supposed to do. And uh, Errol corrected himself. He said he was talking about uh, breeding registered dogs with getting all the genetic tests done and that sort of thing. So yeah, again, Errol, it's just it's a lot of work, easier ways to make money. But um, if you'd love it, then it's a good thing to do if you love. I think that covers all the question, guys. I can't believe how qu how quickly the show just flew by tonight. I could talk about dogs all night. And uh, my guy here... He's uh, he's looking up. I think he knows we're talking about him. So thanks for joining us for the show tonight, guys. And uh, I hope we were able to cover enough good information. We kind of flew through that. I hope you got some good takeaways. Find a good quality. If you want a good homestead dog, you can't do wrong by the lab. If you're really looking for one, you can check out Three Seeders Retrievers. I can't give them enough praise for the quality animal that they have. I didn't even get to tell you my hunting stories with him last week. We went out hunting and he did fantastic. I'll have to save those for another night. Thanks for joining us for this live show. And we'll be back next week. Don't forget about the survey. And remember, the road is rocky. Make home steady. Guys over on YouTube, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm sorry, we, we it flew by. We weren't able to get every, everything I want to talk about. We weren't able to take care of. Um, but thanks for joining us. Thanks for the good questions, guys. Um, one more question we had. M. Joner asks, are you going to be getting into herding? Is hunting all I'm training for? So, again, a good dog that you can control with good commands. I can use bones for some... Uh, just basic herding. Uh, if I'm trying to get my animals in a direction, I can use him to get them there. But 
can't, uh, I would not suggest a lab if that's all you were going to do. There's other good options for that. But guys, thanks for joining us tonight over on YouTube too. We are going to close down the show. We might have to do a follow-up to this episode just because we weren't able to fit everything I wanted to talk about. And we can dive in a little bit more deep on the actual training aspect. Thank you for joining us. I will be sticking around to answer questions in the chat box for a couple more minutes here. Uh, so be sure if you're if you're uh, if you have any more questions I couldn't get to, fire them off in the chat box. We'll talk to you guys next week. <laughs>